Good evening everyone and welcome to the live stream. I hope you're all very well this evening. So let's see who we have on the stream tonight. We have, let me jump to the top. We have uh, FSM is the dog. FSM certainly is the dog. We also have Raven1983 Witch. Great to see you. JPJP, great to have you on. Killer, great to have you on. Thanks for moderating once again. We have CGA, CJM, great to see you CJ. Hope you're fine tonight. We have John O'Sullivan, great to see you John. Roseanne, great to have you on. We also have David Lloyd, great to see you. Zoe Castles, great to have you on once again, Zoe. Miss Grumpy Piggy, <laughs> great to have you on. I love these names. Kathy Doyle, great to see you. Tony, great to have you on. Rupert, great to have you on too. Razor, great to see you. Razor Mouth, cool. Uh, we also have Michael, great to see you. Uh, Katrina, great to have you on. Hope you're well tonight. M. White, great to see you. Um, Time, Mach Time Mechanic, great to have you on. We also have uh, Lynn and Nicholas. Good to see both of you. We're up to 150, 157, so I'll have to go pretty quickly. Richard, Chatty Rat, great to see you all. Uh, we have Ministerian, great to have you on Ministerian. Hope you're well tonight. We have Conservator, Kathy and Eddie, great to see you. Arg, uh, Low Fat, great to see you. Uh, Rumin, great to see you. Maria, great to have you on. Uh, Tiny Demolition Lover, hope you're well tonight. Uh, we have Eddie, great to see you. Jasper, Kathy, Suzanne, Suzanne, great to see you. Eric, great to have you on. Sugar Free, great to see you. Hope you're well tonight. We have uh, Tony, Jasper, Steve, great to see you. Um, we have uh, Archangel, great to have you on. Yoni, great to see you too. Regan Elite, hope you're well. Um, Kendra, great to have you on, and so many others. So I have to go right down to the bottom because there's so many people on tonight. Tom, I see Tom, Daily Blaze, or Blaze, uh, QA Library, great to see you, and so many others. Hope you're all very well tonight. So, um, well, I, <laughs> I assume most of you have seen the video where the Labour MP, um, uh, Don, Don Butler stood up in the House of Commons and called Boris Johnson a liar. Mary Finnegan, great to see you. And she was forced out. She was told to leave the House of Commons because she told Boris Johnson, sorry, said to the uh, to the people there that Boris Johnson told lies. Boris Johnson was a liar. I was thinking, why don't the next MPs do something a little bit different? Why don't they say, Boris Johnson is not a liar. And then ask the Speaker of the House, um, do I need to retract that? And the Speaker will say, why do you need to retract that? And you say, because it's a lie. <laughs> uh, so they would have to correct the record by saying, Boris Johnson is not a liar. <laughs> I'd have to correct that because it's not true. Um, can you do that? But it was a, a wonderful show and I hope more members of parliament do this. I think a member of parliament should do it every time. When there's a debate, uh, when they're asking the prime minister a question, ask the prime minister a question. Why do you lie? Why do you continually lie? And then they'll be told to correct the record. They say no. They'll be asked to leave for the rest of the day. And if a politician does that every week, every time, it's going to be extremely embarrassing for Boris Johnson because it's going to put in the minds of the public that, you know, something that we already know, that he's a liar. But the public will say, well, why are these people being kicked out because for calling Boris Johnson a liar? We all know he's a liar. Liar pants on fire. <laughs> there have been days the Prime Minister has been here and being truthful. Wait, <laughs> I'll have to retract that. Yes. We Scott Star, great to see you. So I want to show you this clip um, from last year, but it's a it's a nice montage of when Boris Johnson was praising the withdrawal agreement. And then I'm going to show you uh, an article about where Boris Johnson is not praising the withdrawal agreement. Do you think that this deal uh, represents uh, a very good deal both for the EU and... I I'm sorry, the Brexit deal. And for the UK, and it's a, a reasonable, fair outcome. It is a great prospect and a great deal, and I commend it to the House. Sorry, it's, no, it, yes, it's the withdrawal agreement. Apologies. They said we'd never get a deal, Mr. Speaker. There's a very good deal on the table here today. I mean, 
unlike Mr Major, I lead a party that is now totally united. All 630 plus Conservative candidates at this election actually back my deal. And we have a deal. It's a wonderful deal. We're coming out on January the 31st. Do you? Do you? On the contrary. We have a fantastic deal. It is there, ready to go. And not the, the Northern Ireland is part of the customs territory of the UK. You know, isn't, that, isn't that problem, Mr say, Johnson, that the DUP, say, the unionists, who were your partners, they agree with him and not you well, about that? they don't, actually, that. because, because uh, our deal is a great deal. Well, let me just make one, one point. I do, because we have a deal that, as I say, is oven ready. It's ready to, to go. And it's approved, as I say, not just by our friends and partners in the U EU, but by every one of the 635 Conservative candidates. And it delivers everything that we wanted from Brexit. Our whole country comes out entire and perfect. England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland together. And there is well, we have a, a great deal that is uh, supported, as, as Mr Corbyn says, not just by uh, many members of his own party, but by the entire Conservative Party now, and 635 Conservative candidates uh, have, have backed it, and the treaty they said it was impossible to do, actually we succeeded. And we have a great new deal that, as I say, is oven ready, ready to go. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Corbyn, Mr well, Johnson. We have a, a deal that keeps the whole of the UK together as we come out of the EU. I think what people need to understand is whether he believes in the deal that he is proposing to do. Does he actually want to do this deal? So what's strange is Boris Johnson has now said post-Brexit deal for Northern Ireland is unsustainable. So British Prime Minister Boris Johnson urged the European Union Thursday to take seriously look seriously sorry to, to look seriously at the UK proposals to overhaul their post-Brexit deal trade deal for Northern Ireland. Uh, but met immediate resistance in Brussels. Not the post-Brexit uh, trade deal, it's about the withdrawal agreement. The withdrawal agreement needs to be... Un it needs to be rehashed, renegotiated. This is what Boris Johnson wants to do. So he went from saying that the trade deal... Sorry, I keep saying the trade deal. The withdrawal agreement, his deal, the oven-ready deal, was perfect, to now it's a problem. Well, the... <sighs> EU have said, look, you negotiated this deal, you signed it, you ran it through Parliament, you ran, um, you ran on an election pledge with this trade deal, this deal, sorry, I keep calling it a trade deal, with this deal, the withdrawal agreement. And how can you turn around now and say that you want to renegotiate it? So the European Union have basically said, no, it's not going to be renegotiated. So you can see here, von der Leyen projects Boris Johnson's bid to renegoci renegotiate Irish Protocol, Northern Arm, the Northern Arm Protocol. The President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has rejected Boris Johnson's move to renegotiate the Northern Irish Protocol, raising the temperature of a simmering Brexit row. The EU will continue to, ch uh, create, um, to be creative and flexible within the protocol framework, but we will not renegotiate. She said after a call with the Prime Minister on Thursday. EU sources said that the, la the, the call lasted about 30 minutes and von der Leyen made clear they spoke at Johnson's request. Hmm. So Boris Johnson wanted to speak and ask for them to renegotiate. <laughs> and he said no. I, I wonder how long, it, why that call took 30 minutes. It was a long call. Was it like no? And he's like, can we? No. Please? No. Pretty please, no. Please with sugar on top, no. <laughs> While not a surprise, her refusal less than 24 hours after the government set out a plan to renegotiate a core part of the Brexit deal is a blow to Johnson, who made repeated false claims that it, there would be no customs checks uh, between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, as you saw in that video clip. He said, look, all of the UK was leaving. Northern Ireland would not be left behind. Now, Boris Johnson was either lying or he didn't know which is it. Maybe it's both. The EU has uh, has united against the UK blueprint to rewrite the Northern Ireland Protocol, a far, uh, hard-fought agreement with Johnson in 2019 that created customs border in the Irish Sea. In an official readout of the Prime Minister's call with the van der Leyen, 
Uh, Downing Street spokesperson repeated the UK's uh, UK government's case for renegotiation. The Prime Minister set out that the way the protocol was currently operating was unsustainable. Solutions could not be found though the exist- through the existing mechanisms of the protocol. That is why we need to set out a proposal for significant changes to it. How can it be, you know, you go from this is an oven ready deal to um, it's not really working out as we thought. And I've said on numerous occasions, the EU doesn't have a problem with it. The EU wasn't going around saying this is an oven ready deal. This is a wonderful deal. This is the deal of the century. They said, we're happy with this. Okay. And Boris Johnson, how many times did he say in that clip, a wonderful deal, a great deal, the deal of the century, a deal uh, for the future, a perfect deal, oven ready deal, stick it in the oven, gas mark five, stick it, no, stick it in the microwave, gas mark five. Um, got an 80 seat majority on it. And now he's saying, um, no, it needs, it's, it's unsustainable. Like, once again, I've as I've said, they haven't explicitly said or they haven't said what the specific problems are. Boris Johnson or Michael Go, not sorry, um, Lord Frost or the Northern Ireland Secretary have never indicated the exact problems of the protocol. Because if they did, then they'd have to say, yes, these are the problems. And then the next question would be, then didn't you know about that? And their answer would have to be, yes, we did. Then the, the following question would be, then why didn't you do something about it when, during the negotiations? And then how would they answer that question? Because it, the other answer could be, no, we didn't know about it. And then it would be, why did you not know about it? Didn't you sign it? Didn't you read it? And the answer would have to be, no. <laughs> no, we didn't actually read it. Why did you not read it? Uh, because it was in a hurry. Why was it in a hurry? Because Boris Johnson decided he wanted um, everything everything done quickly and not to spend the right time to, uh, to cross every T and dot every I. Gove is super quiet, be afraid. I think Gove is, yeah, working behind the scenes. Um, Boris put his deal into the electric oven, then tried to fire it up with matches. <laughs> That's the problem, chatty rat. I think we found the reason why it's not working. <laughs> oven ready deal, two pounds as the deal. <laughs> oven ready, two pounds as the deal. <laughs> the uh, Taj Mahali of deals is meant as the casino. If only Tim Martin was prime minister, then he would have gotten them all paste and get a great deal. <laughs> um, just like Borish <laughs> to agree to something then withdrawal and not support it. <laughs> it much like him and uh, how many kids do, was that? Yes. Yeah, it's exactly like Boris Johnson. Have his fun and then let someone else pick up the pieces. Ah, he urged the EU to look at these uh, those proposals and to work within the UK, uh, work with the UK on them. There is a huge opportunity to find reasonable, practical solutions to the difficulties facing people and businesses in Northern Ireland, and therefore to put the relationship between the UK and the EU on a better footing. They agreed uh, to remain in touch. What's interesting is they highlight businesses, but most of the businesses in Northern Ireland are getting on with business. Most businesses in Northern Ireland understand, yes, this is a problem, but they're not asking for the protocol to be ripped up. The only people asking for the protocol to be ripped up in Northern Ireland are the DUP, and the only people who have a problem with the protocol in Great Britain are Brexiteers. Isn't it so ironic that the people who were suggesting that any type of problems emanating from Brexit, you know, before we arrived at this stage, were Remainers. The people They, they were the people saying, look, there are going to be problems. The ones who were rejecting any idea of, of problems were Brexiteers. And now that we have these problems, that they are saying that there are these problems, Remainers are being quiet. They're saying, look, we have to work within the, pro- the framework of the protocol. While Brexiteers are saying, 
this thing needs to be torn up. This is not working. This is a, a disaster. What they wanted is a disaster. Remainers were saying there was going to be a, a problem. And the response, of course, was don't engage in project fear. Stop scaremongering. No humility at all. Um, the, he urged the... Sorry, yes, I said that already. Um, the Prime Minister made the same point in a separate call with Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel. Johnson's spokesman said the Prime Minister didn't expect the EU to take such a purist and maximist, maximalist approach to, implement, uh, to implementing the protocol, but did not point out any breaches by Brussels of the agreement. There's, uh, there are real-life issues that people are facing on the ground in Northern Ireland that need to be addressed, the spokesperson said, adding that the government had launched a consultation intending to slash Brexit red tape. <laughs> oh my god. The uh, Johnson spokesperson said the Prime Minister did not want the protocol scrapped at this time. So it's the protocol is so bad... We're, we could invoke Article 16, but we're not going to. The protocol is so bad it needs to be renegotiated, but not yet. It's just trying. They're just trying. Uh, the UK's attempt to renegotiate has exacerbated EU decision makers who have uh, already proposed changes um, to lessen the impact on Northern Ireland citizens. Further tweaks remain possible, but the EU has ruled out a full-scale rene renegotiation. Uh, in an unusually blunt statement, the German government spokesperson tweeted, um, It is so much to expect the UK to stand by what it has negotiated, signed and ratified. So we'll see how this evolves. Um, I have a feeling, look... It's another attempt by Brexiteers like Lord Frost or uh, Boris Johnson or the Northern Ireland Secretary to look like they're doing something. But I think at the end of the day, they're not really expecting the EU to renegotiate. This is just another saber-rattling exercise uh, to, to, once again, convince the public that they're doing something, when in reality they're doing nothing. And I think what's going to happen is they're... They will attempt, in a sense, to undermine the single market, but the EU is going is not going to allow that. Instead, what's probably going to happen is the grace periods are going to be extended again. Businesses in Northern Ireland are going to readapt. They're going to adapt to the new scenario, to the new uh, conditions. They're going to realign with um, suppliers in other parts of Europe or in the Republic of Ireland, or suppliers in Northern Ireland itself. And the rhetoric surrounding the protocol is going to get weaker and weaker, and we're going to sort of forget about it, I think. Until it comes up again, where there is some other uh, possibility of using it as a cudgel against the European Union, when Boris Johnson wants some other concession. But I don't see it actually working. Um We've seen how even the loyalist community, they're running out of steam. They have been you know, protesting, they have been marching against the protocol, but a lot of that has died down. We're not hearing much about much from them at the moment. So it could be a case of here, the last bit of steam from Brexiteers and then we'll move on to something else. But we'll see how this progresses. Um... I just want to show you this clip. You've probably already seen it. It's uh, It's been all over the internet. It's, of course, um, uh, Don Butler standing up in the House of Commons calling Boris Johnson a liar and being removed. Madam Deputy Speaker, poor people in our country have paid with their lives because the Prime Minister spent the last 18 months misleading this House and the country. Peter Stefanik from the CWU has over 27 million views on his online, and let me tell you some of them. He highlights that the Prime Minister said the economy has grown by 73 per cent. It's just not true. Reinstated nurses bursary, just not true. There wasn't an app working anywhere in the world, just isn't true. Tories invested 34 billion in the NHS, not true. The Prime Minister said we have severed the link between infection 
infection and serious disease and death. Not only is this not true, Madam Deputy Speaker, but it is dangerous, and it's dangerous to line the pandemic. And I'm disappointed that the Prime Minister has not come to the House to correct the record and to correct the fact that he has lied to this House and the country over and over again. Order. I'm, I'm sure that the, um, the member will um, reflect on um, her words just then, perhaps correct the record. Something the, the Speaker could have done is just let it go. What would have happened if the Speaker had let it go? It said nothing. But, okay, the Prime Minister, is the Prime Minister here? No, the Prime Minister is not here to correct the record. Okay, let's move on. Because the Speaker knows that Boris Johnson lies. Everyone in Parliament knows that Boris Johnson lies. So what's the point in making an issue out of this? Madam Deputy Speaker, what would you rather, a weakened leg or a severed leg? You know, at the end of the day, the Prime Minister has lied to this House time and time again. And it's funny that we get in trouble in this place for calling out the lie rather than the person lying. Order, order, order. Order. Can you re please, please reflect on your words and withdraw your remarks? Deputy Speaker, I've reflected on my words and somebody needs to tell the truth in this house that the Prime Minister has lied. <laughs> just, just let's say, well, okay. <laughs> yes, we know that the Prime Minister has lied, but there's nothing we can do about it. You know, be honest. When, why isn't the Speaker of the House saying, yes, we know that he lies, but we can't do anything about it. We've asked him to come back to um, the, the House to correct the record, but he doesn't do that. We, my hands are tied. Under the power given me by standing order number 43, I order the member to withdraw immediately from the House for the remainder of the day's sitting. I call Tom Randall. Thank you, Madam. What a, what a joke. Parliament is a joke. You're punishing somebody for telling the truth. And you're not punishing somebody for telling lies. Like, they should say to Boris Johnson, I'm, you know, you come back to the house when you've corrected the record. Don't come back to the house until you have corrected the record. What's the point in Boris Johnson staying in the House of Commons, frequenting the House of Commons, if he doesn't tell the truth? There's no punishment. So I hope what's going to happen is more and more MPs, both from the Labour Party, the SNP, uh, the Liberal Democrats, Greens, whoever, independence stand up and call Boris Johnson a liar do it you'll be asked to leave for the rest of the day maybe do it towards the end of the day <laughs> so you get off early but do it what what does it cost you it demonstrates to the public that Boris Johnson is being protected by parliament and you by speaking the truth are being removed are being punished no good deed goes unpunished as they say uh, let me read some of your comments um, to remove her, how poor this one, this is. I understand there are rules, but isn't there a rule that the Prime Minister or a Minister should correct the record? If they don't correct the record, what is, the, what, is there no consequence to that? And I also think that the Speaker has a huge amount of power in, for example, somebody had said in the, in the comments section once or on the stream, that Keir Starmer should sit down and remain seated. And when he's asked to speak, you know, when it goes Keir Starmer or the leader of the, the, leader of the opposition, he should s remain seated until Boris Johnson answers the question. So he said, you know, the Speaker of the House is uh, after Boris Johnson has said something and Keir Starmer stands up and asks a question and then Boris Johnson doesn't answer the question. And Boris Johnson sits down and it's Keir Starmer's turn. Keir Starmer should remain seated and say, well, I'll, I'll get up when the Prime Minister answers the question. How about trying that? What would the Speaker then do? Tell you to leave? <laughs> and then if he tells you to leave, then leave. And say, I'm leaving because the Prime Minister didn't answer the question. And you will have the public on your side. I, I noticed a lot of comments you know, on Twitter um on on YouTube as well, people who don't actually like Don Butler, who were commending her, who were saying, well done. 
I don't agree with uh, Don Butler, but she did the right thing. How is it possible that she's been kicked out for calling Boris Johnson a liar when we all know that he is a liar? Uh, to be fair, Blackford um, has asked you to ask if um, are you a liar, Prime Minister? Yeah. So um, Ian Blackford was uh, was sort of bending the rules a little bit when he called. He asked Boris Johnson, "Are you a liar?" Because he's not suggesting Boris Johnson is a liar. He's just asking a question, and I think more. You could use tools like that. You could ask the Prime Minister, are you a liar? <laughs> All Boris Johnson has to say is, no, I'm not. And then we, and then the whole of uh, Parliament would burst, it would burst out laughing, of course. Um, 457 viewers smashed that like button, guys. So, but that was a wonderful scene. And I really hope we're going to see more of it. Uh, let me read more of your comments. Um... Ministers are supposed to correct the record, are supposed to correct the record, but they do not. Can it be called a... Uh, <laughs> Ian Blackford, hold my beer. <laughs> are you a liar, Bozo? Yeah, you could do, you do things, you could do something like, um, is Boris Johnson a liar? Because you're, you're supposed to refer to the Prime Minister, you're not supposed to call him by his name. But if you don't say, if you just say, is a certain individual Boris Johnson a liar or Mr. Johnson a liar? You could say something like that. I think you'd get round the rules because we all know that the Prime Minister is Boris Johnson, but you're supposed to refer to the Prime Minister as Prime Minister, not by his name. You're not supposed to use anyone's name in the House of Commons unless you're being punished, I think. Annoy, annoy Boris until he snaps is the only thing you can do. Yeah. Um, and you need to be, see, it's, and it's difficult in with the way Parliament is um, organised, because the leader of the opposition can ask a number of questions, but most, but the leader, for example, of the SNP can only ask two questions. Um, so you need to, uh, where's De Dennis Skinner when you need him? Exactly, Dennis Skinner was. I don't know was how many times he was thrown out of Parliament. Um, there are other things you can grab the the mace, but I, I think it it makes more sense just to attack the prime minister, attack his lies, say that he's a liar, call him out. Uh, I'm surprised Ian Blackford was not called for using that language. I, I think he because he didn't. I think he got a bit of a rap on the knuckles, but he wasn't told to leave. Um, also because it was the second question, so he wasn't going to remain there to ask more questions, or he wasn't able to. I don't think it was a debate. Um, so I think this was a debate. So it was a different... Um, a, it was a different way. Or maybe it was business. I, I don't remember what happened here. But I think uh, it depends on the the business of the day. If it's a PMQs or if it's a, a debate or if it's um, business questions. It, it, it depends on... Uh, there are different rules for different uh, occasions. Anyway, guys, let's uh, let's move on. Um, let me see. Yes. So I'm going to show you this video. It's about well. Sec so, the environment secretary was <clears throat> interviewed by um, Sky News about the ping demic. So the pandemic, if you're not familiar, of course, is a, a number of people were sent a ping and they were told to self-isolate. Um, some of um, well, some of them work in industries that need them; they're critical, and because they're not available, means that there's cre they're creating problems. And we've seen how supermarkets aren't able to f pack their shelves again because they don't have. Um, lorries coming in with ex with new with uh, replacement goods some of these goods can't be replaced because the supply chain has been affected by uh, the ping demic where people are being pinged in order to self isolate um now some of this is because of brexit some of this is because of the pandemic unfortunately the media and the government are blaming it all on this ping on all the on all of it on this app when a lot of it is down to Brexit. Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs is with us. George Eustace, hello to you. Good morning. Uh, yesterday it wasn't a big problem. Today, how big a problem is it? 
Well, look, we've been working closely with the food industry, uh, both the manufacturers and the retailers over the last week or so, monitoring the situation closely, uh, looking at um, indices such as late deliveries to individual stores and uh, absence levels. And um, the industry had some concerns at the end of last week, but we've been keeping it under close review. What's clear is that early this week, uh, those absence levels got to about 15, in some cases 20%. And that's why we decided to act swiftly to make sure that the food supply chain can continue to function normally. How many people are going to be exempt from uh, having to isolate if they're picked? Well so the app is fine the virus is running wild <laughs> yes it's the virus that's the problem it's not just the app um yeah the app told people to self-isolate but there are was it 50 50 000 cases or forty thousand cases yesterday um i haven't checked it actually useless <laughs> but what they're trying to do is they're trying to say it's because of uh the app it's because of the the pandemic when Heavy goods vehicle drivers are not available. If they're not available, they're not taking raw materials to to be processed. These raw materials are not processed. They're not being sent to the man to man to be um to the suppliers who then supply the supermarkets or whatever. If this is being this part is being removed from the chain, the entire thing is falling apart. There are stories of um. Companies who are wait who have goods produced but they can't ship them because they don't have the lorry drivers. There are other uh, stories of companies who can't get the raw materials because the lorry drivers are not available. We've I've covered it already. You know, peppers and courgettes rotting in fields because they're being picked, but they're not being they they're not being collected. They need to be picked and collected and shipped to the supermarkets but they're not been doing it's not happening for two reasons one is heavy goods vehicle drivers and the other is a shortage of pickers so whatever is being picked is not being shipped and whatever um isn't being picked is rotting on the on the plants well, uh, under the scheme that we've put forward now for the food sector, we've identified close to 500 key sites. That uh, includes around 170 supermarket depots uh, and then another couple of hundred key... So the solution to this, in their eyes, is just, well, we're going to exempt people from isolation. <laughs> what? It's like saying, OK, we have a fire and we, we only have one fire extinguisher. So instead of actually trying to use that one fire extinguisher, we're going to just not let use any fire extinguishers. <laughs> you know, the, the reason you isolate people is to stop the spread. By saying we're going to exempt people from isolating means we don't care about the spread. It seems to be the case now that the government just want the virus to spread like wildfire manufacturers like our bread manufacturers dairy companies and so on uh, and uh, all of the people working in those key strategic sites uh, distribution depots uh, and those manufacturing facilities will be able to use this scheme and now, this is a question i don't know maybe you guys can answer how many of these people who are working in these sites have received the vaccine because i don't know if there's a because I'm trying to think of the average age of people working in warehouses or in supply chains. I'm I'm imagining it being the lower end of the scale in, in the sense that it's probably people under the age of 40, maybe under the age of 30. So the majority of these people, have they had their vaccine job? Have they had the first and second job? I don't know. Maybe someone in the chat can tell me if that's if that's happening or not. But it's extremely concerning if they haven't, because normally you would tell them to isolate if they have come into contact with somebody who's infected. Now you're telling them not to, and they don't have the jab to protect them. What, what, at what stage are you going to say these people need to self-isolate? It's probably well over 10,000 people. Yeah, I see, see, the thing is, when the minister was sitting there yesterday, he was giving me the impression that I was overreacting by saying that there was a problem. Well, I think he was right in the sense that um, 
uh, there wasn't a problem in that we had um, some stress starting to come on the system, uh, but we were working closely with industry, and it was really during the course of yesterday, uh, having had further discussions with them, seeing that absence rates uh, had increased to a level uh, that was starting to concern us, and that it was likely now to continue to increase a bit further. It was um, that that decided, uh, uh, decided the situation, and we acted swiftly. You know, we're never going to take risks with our food supply. Uh, Unless it came to Brexit, of course. You know, when it came to Brexit, well, to hell with the food supply. <laughs> um, the Ping cost, the Ping app cost 111, 110 Brexit buses. Wow. That puts it in, into perspective. Teachers didn't get vaccine early, only NHS workers and care workers. Cromwell was English, not Irish. Um... Uh, meat packing and slaughterhouses, you have to be over 21 to work. Thanks for that QA library. So, yeah, so I imagine, but it's under, I'm, I'm thinking people under the age of 30 is the majority in working in these areas, um, in these sectors. But I doubt they have had access to the vaccine. I doubt they've had at least, you know, two jabs. Some of them maybe have had the first job, but I doubt... Um, the majority the majority of them have had both jabs. And that's why we've acted in the way we have. A lot of red tape still, though, isn't there? I mean, people have to apply to be exempt, don't they? It's not as straightforward as just saying, OK, you can come in if you've been pinned. Well, there's two separate uh, schemes. So um, we have one for the food. Is. Of course. Uh, we, uh, and, 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 and these seem counters and seem complicated. So for sectors like um, the nuclear power industry, the rail network, uh, the, the water industry, where you have um, a small number of um, highly sk skilled professionals that you need to ensure can uh, come to work, uh, we're, we're having a, a, an exemption for them as well, where they, um, and it, but it's quite a narrow exemption. Uh, for the food sector, it's very different. Uh, this is is a uh, you know quite a quite a big exemption. But they don't need to apply. Uh, they don't need to apply, but we are working with all of those um, uh, food companies. We've identified the 500 sites. They the, the sites will be designated, and then they'll be able to operate this at a site level. Yeah, you see, the thing is, the hospitality sector is not included. Is it? It's been one of the hardest hits throughout the pandemic. Could they potentially, going forward, be added to the list? Well, look, obviously, um, for everyone, uh, in the middle of August, we intend to move to a, a different system. Yeah, where, but for I mean, now? Uh, for now, um, I think not, no. So we are obviously keeping everything under review. The reason we've made a special uh, exception... The response to everything is, we're keeping it under review. <laughs> it's like, means we don't actually have a plan. We're just doing it from, day, from a day-to-day -day basis. We're, we're trying everything... We try this. Does it work? No. Okay, let's try something else. Does it work? No. Okay, let's try this. Does it work? Mm, somewhat. Okay, well, let's keep using that until it breaks and then we'll try something else. That seems to be the plan. Sorry, somebody asked if I have an... Is that a Newbridge accent? <laughs> no, no, not near Newbridge. A bit further away from there. <laughs> And, uh, for food is for very obvious reasons. Uh, we need to make sure that we maintain our food supply. We will never take risks with our food supply. Uh, when it comes to other sectors, yes, of course, the fact that they are also carrying... How can he sit there and say we're, we're not going to take risks with our food supply? And he was a member of UKIP. And now he's the Environment Secretary, a Brexiteer, saying we will not take a risk, we'll not, we'll ta we will not take risks with our food supply. Really? High absence levels is causing some stress for them a and it's making it um, uh, more difficult. But you also have to bear in mind why we're doing this and we are trying to still just dampen uh, the, the pace and the velocity at which uh, this infection is spreading because we have to keep a, a very close eye on those hospitalizations. We know that if people are double jabbed, uh, then between 92 and 96% uh, reduction in hospitalizations is what we can expect. Uh, but there will still be some hospitalizations and sadly still uh, some deaths. And we just need to make sure uh, that we don't have this uh, growing too quickly. And that's the... Oh my God. Okay, um, let me read some more of your comments. Um, don't panic. <laughs> uh, how strange that they're using the COVID app is only now causing food uh, supply shortages in the UK and not in the rest of Europe, as it would if it, it might have been... Uh, sorry, said Imer. Um, it, uh, it as if it... Uh, sorry, I missed the, the comment rolled past. 
sorry, how strange that using the COVID app is only now is only causing food problems, so food supply issues in the UK and not in the rest of Europe. It's as if they might be. Uh, might be something else going on. <laughs> yes. Um, what could that be? I wonder what that could be. I'm getting angry. Max, um, he means that he wants to be sure of destroying our, our food supply. <laughs> Sounds more like a Bray accent. Bray? No. Think Midlands. What is an acceptable level of deaths? Artemis, great to see you on the stream. Of course, all this has nothing to do with Brexit. <laughs> like, if you don't have... I, I really wish they'd ask him, well, why is there a shortage of heavy goods vehicle drivers? Businesses are saying that they can't get their goods to market. Businesses are saying that they can't get their supplies. Why is that happening? Why is there a shortage of heavy goods vehicle drivers? And why are you not adding them to the um, shortage occupation list, which would speed up the process of getting them back into the UK. But they don't want to answer that question because they know that, well, you know, we, we didn't want these foreigners here in the first place because, you know, it's what Brexiteers voted for, in part. I'm not saying all Brexiteers voted to stop immigrants coming into the country or to kick the um, the existing ones out but it seems to be that um, when you scratch the surface when you ask enough questions you generally get back to the issue of immigration which is really depressing because people many people if you if you ask them at the beginning they'll say oh, it was about taking back control and then you go, okay taking back control of what of the of our rules, what rules? Okay, of um, the border. Okay, ah, the border. All right, Atlone, no, north of Atlone. <laughs> um, taking back control of the the border. Okay, the border in what way? Ah, because there are too many immigrants coming in. Ah, there we go. That was quick, <laughs> but it, sometimes it can take a little bit longer. But you will eventually get there. Now, I'm not saying everyone who voted for Brexit voted for to stop immigrants from coming into the country. Um, some people did it for maybe economic reasons. Um, like, for example, what is it? The lead singer of Iron Maiden. I don't think when he said he voted for Brexit, I don't think he voted in order to keep immigrants out. I think it was maybe because he thought that you know by remaining in the european union he might made he might need to pay more tax and he wasn't ha too happy with that you know generally these people when they have when they have hundreds of millions of pounds or hundreds of millions of euros they like they get a bit greedy and they don't like to spread it about and they're willing to vote for horrible individuals in order to keep um their taxes away from the exchequer or sorry to keep their cash away from the exchequer Bit south. <laughs> Ballymore. No, <laughs> south of Cavan. No, there, I've, I've given it away. Anyway, so it says here, super, uh, UK supermarkets ask suppliers for payments due to driver shortages. Uh, shortage. So it says here, this is very interesting. Asda, Tesco and Sainsbury's are asking some suppliers for extra payments to cover the increased cost Costs after being forced to raise wages for delivery drivers because of widespread shortages. Now, the problem here, of course, is that if supermarkets are increasing their prices in order to pay, um, increasing their, their prices in order to pay more uh, for the way, sorry, pay. look, I'm looking at the chat now, I'm getting distracted. <laughs> if, um, if supermarkets are paying more to cover the cost of drivers, they have to pass it on to someone. And of course, they pass it on to the consumer, which means that your your groceries are going to cost more. And if you're a millionaire Brexiteer, you don't worry about that. If your bottle of wine goes from six pounds to seven pounds, it's not a big problem. But if you're on universal credit, if you're on a tight budget, wow, someone 
Uh, Romain is very, very close. <laughs> Romain 13. Wow. Um, if you're on a very tight budget and the, and the price of bread goes up from 50p to 60p or from 80p to one pound, that's a huge difference. That, that's a huge impact on your on your budget. Concentrate, Max, yes. <laughs> uh, it's a huge impact. And as, as I've said before, the people who were pushing Brexit, they, were, they had no problems. They had no economic uh, concerns. Nigel Farage is not affected by the consequences of Brexit. In a way, he's actually benefited from Brexit, of course. You see him chauffeur driven around <clears throat> in a Range Rover at the moment, you know, checking in on immigrants who poor people, checking in on poor people who are staying in hotels because they have nowhere else to stay. Because if they stay in another location, they're likely to be firebombed. Um, Nigel Farage has not been affected by Brexit. If if business is closed, he's okay. Business is closed. Boris Johnson is okay. Business is closed. Probably Jacob Rees Mogg actually does better because of the industry he has, you know, as a hobby. Anyway, in a letter sent to the Guardian, Asda wrote to suppliers that use of its collection uh, collection service asking for a 5% rise in payments for transport costs and blaming the national heavy goods vehicle driver shortage. The UK's third largest supermarket, which was recently taken over by billionaire owners of petrol station business EG Group and uh, private equity firm T TDR um, Capital, said it needed, to, uh, needed help to deal with the 12% rise in driver costs in some areas. Andy, thank you so much for that super chat. Boris is a liar. Boris is a liar. La 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 la. la. Everyone, Boris is a liar. Boris is a liar. La 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 la. la. <laughs> Good, Andy. <laughs> Are you suggesting that Boris Johnson is less than honest? <laughs> Old Castle, no. <laughs> Granard was right. Granard, very near Granard. I'm not exactly there, but very close. I've given it away. Um. So it goes on to say, uh, Asda said, we're passing on any cost to suppliers as a last resort. The challenges in the logistics industry remain unresolved. And as a result, we are looking work, uh, we are looking to work closely with our supplier, supplies, um, char sorry, supply partners to change the rates we provide for this service. Asda request, Asda's request to suppliers follow Tesco's demand for a near 18% rise in delivery costs for suppliers late last month, uh, just after just over 10% point percentage points of which it said it was solely down to the increased wages of uh, for drivers. So, uh, Sainsbury's said some suppliers for uh, as for some suppliers for a 2.9% increase in delivery costs from uh, the 3rd of October without explaining its reasons. In a detailed letter first reported by the uh, by the Grocer Trade Journal, Asda blamed the shortage of dr uh, delivery drivers on a mix of Brexit, which has affected the rights of European drivers to work in the UK, and the COVID-19 pandemic, which has restricted cross-border travel and sent many drivers home for extended periods of lockdown, as well as tax changes and a shortage of testing facilities. Yeah, so there's a lot to uh, unwind here. Um... Uh, Traduz, Traduz uh, Cantel, thank you so much for that super chat. Uh, didn't know, uh, don't know the accent. Definitely not Wickla. <laughs> we'll take a random guess at Eden Dairy. Ah, oh, very well, very close. Uh, thanks for that super chat. No, I'm actually Longford. Ta da! <laughs> um, but I don't know how much of that has remained because I've been living in Italy so long. So. If Boris were Pinocchio, how long would his nose be by now? It would be probably reaching the moon, I think. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so there's a lot to unpack here. So we, we have Brexit, of course, which has caused European drivers um, problems of working in the UK. Uh, the pandemic, which has restricted travel cross borders because drivers have to get tested when they travel into France, for example, if they're returning with a load. 
Uh, I imagine also it's the same case if lorry drivers are crossing from France into the UK, they have to be tested, which is slowing things down and it's turning off a lot of drivers because you know it causes causes delays. And uh, tax changes. So the, the government have changed some tax rules so that as far as I know, it's individual drivers have to operate a bit like companies and this is costing them a lot. And then there there's a lack of testing facilities so there's a backlog um there's a shortage of drivers the uk government wants to hire as many as possible but there aren't enough testing facilities and there aren't enough examiners so you need to train up examiners you need to train uh, to to get the uh to get this backlog cleared that takes time i don't even know if there are enough examiners to be trained up or if they're going to do that or they're just going to try and use the existing number of examiners to clear the backlog. While we continue to take on extra cost and deal with uh, with all these issues that we encounter, we need to recover some of the additional costs the company wrote to suppliers. Logistics UK, which represents freight owners, including supermarkets, has estimated that a shortage of 90,000 heavy goods vehicle drivers, including about 25,000 from the EU, who have gone home following Brexit. Uh, On top of that, there is a backlog of 25,000 applications for uh, lorry driving licenses. So even if you could clear the the backlog, you're still missing a huge number of drivers. So there's a shortage of 90,000. You're not going to be able to fill all of those. Now, unless, (laughs) as I talked about at the last live stream, that the the government decide look what we're going to do is we're just going to make people (laughs) lorry drivers a bit like what you did in the 1970s or somebody had said in the 1980s uh in ireland where you know (laughs) there was a a license amnesty (laughs) where you know if you could demonstrate you could drive a car reasonably well then we give you a license i really hope they don't do that with heavy goods vehicle in the uk you know, post-Brexit and all that. That would be insane. Anyway, let's let's move on. Um, before we move on to that, I want to take a little break because we're halfway through the stream, as always. I want to show you a funny video and then we'll continue with the, the serious stuff in a moment. And of course, I'm going to talk, if I have time, about UBI. Yes, many people want me to cover this topic, UBI, Universal Basic Income. But let's see this first. Hey, pal. Oh, sorry to hear the business is in trouble. <laughs> Workers rebelling and everything. Was it just a case of mismanagement? I was right all along stuff or? Well, we do most of our business with you and you put debilitating restrictions on what we can buy and sell. So, yeah, yeah. Look, it's, it's a crazy time for all of us. Do you want me to uh, step in? You already have, no? Aren't you financially supporting those trying to take me down? What? Uh Uh-oh, tinfoil hat and no more drinkies over here, please, Tracy. (laughs) Conspiracy theories, really, pal? I mean, what have I ever done to harm you guys? Didn't you try to kill one of my predecessors 638 times? Did I? (laughs) Uh, I don't think that's widely known, so uh, I don't remember. Look, do you want my help or not? You know, because to be honest, you're coming across a little ungrateful. I mean, when has me sticking my head into someone else's business ever ended badly? (laughs) I mean, are you denying your business has problems? No, we've got lots of problems, I'll admit it. But uh, you meddling isn't the solution to any of them. Oh my God, I don't know what more I can do for you. How about dropping the restrictions? Yeah, um... No, no, you'd, you'd rather just help put another guy in charge more amenable to you and your business interests? Honestly? Option B, yeah. <laughs> Good luck with it all anyway, yeah? Oh, hey, pal! Sorry to hear the business is in trouble. <laughs> yeah, no, totally, totally. Hmm? What? <laughs> Very good. Um... Uh... Tadus uh, can tell once again, thank you so much for the super chat. The 70s amnesty was for people who had a provisional license for over five years. Ah, okay. Although they hadn't passed a test. 
I don't think it was a requirement to have actually passed a test anymore. So you could say, I understand people would, okay, you had a provisional license for five years, then you were probably able to drive, <laughs> um, but you couldn't prove it, which was a bit of a problem. Thanks for that. Thanks very much for that super chat. So sticking on the topic of uh, heavy goods vehicle drivers, it says here, safety fears. Now, this is from the Express. OK, so don't take it too seriously. But it says here, safety fears as lorry, uh, lorry tests relaxed to cope with demand after Brexit and COVID. This is concerning. So the government announced this week that heavy goods vehicle drivers will only need to pass one test rather than two in a bid to save the industry from collapse. The Driver and Vehicle Standards Agency has already worked to ensure almost 1,500 heavy goods vehicle drivers pass their test every week. But under new rules, drivers uh, would need to take one test to drive both an articulated and rigid lorry. Hmm. This would streamline the process for new drivers to gain their heavy goods vehicle license and would increase lorry test appointment availability. So the solution seems to be, OK, we have this backlog. Tens of thousands of drivers, tens of thousands of candidates want to get their license. We don't have enough avail uh, availability. We don't have enough test test centers. We don't have enough examiners. So instead of having two tests, let's have one test. Instead of having a test for an articulated lorry and a rigid lorry, we'll just have one test for both of them. Hmm. Off-road maneuvers are set to be removed from the, the official test. Transport Secretary Grant Shapps, Snaps, Shapps, whatever his name is, <laughs> praised the move, saying it would help bounce back industry after the pandemic. He said, I want to thank all those on the, um, in the road haulage industry who have worked so hard throughout the pandemic to provide such a vital service. I understand the challenges facing, faced by drivers and operators right now. So this, this is really frustrating because what the industry actually asked for was to add drivers, heavy goods vehicle drivers, to the shortage occupational list. But the government said, no, we're not going to do that. We're just going to make the tests easier or fewer. Despite the government's optimism, many campaigners are concerned that it could lead to more accidents on the road. Another Brexit benefit. <laughs> Getting run over by a lorry because the lorry driver um, was trained to use a fixed trailer, fixed lorry and not an articulated one. While ministers insist that road safety remains of paramount importance, yes, Groups like Best for Britain criticise the plans. They accuse the government of of sticking plaster solutions um, which could make roads more dangerous for all drivers. It is believed that the shortfall of around 60,000 60, heavy goods vehicle drivers in the UK. In addition, there are many... Um, in addition to many EU drivers shunning the UK, it's not so much shunning the UK they can't get in, Thousands of tests were cancelled before the uh, the COVID pandemic because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, pandemic, around thirty thousand learner drivers are still waiting for a heavy goods vehicle test. Becky Needham, the road safety officer for the Royal Society of Prevention of Accidents, uh, acknowledged driver shortage but said we do not see that removing elements of the current test is the answer. You know, the people who are saying, <laughs> who's part of the organization to prevent road accidents is saying, this is not a good idea. I don't know, experts, once again, Brexiteers ignoring experts. Our view is that the test, as it stands, protects the drivers themselves, other road users and the public. And we do not want to have the, uh, their safety compromised in any way but by this proposal. Scottish industry leaders also have also called on the government to intervene as they fear food shortages and rising prices um, <laughs> could occur uh, within the next few weeks. What, no, what I'm laughing here is about one of the solutions also was to get the army to do it. <laughs> but the problem with that is that there aren't enough soldiers. Why are there not enough soldiers? Because the, the Tories have cut the armed services over the last number of years. 
So Boris Johnson said, I'm, go I'm not going to cut the armed services, and he cut the armed services. And the Brexiteers, some of the Brexiteers are saying, we should use the army. And the response, oh, we can't. Why not? Because we don't have the soldiers. Th this seems to be a Brexit solution to a Brexit problem. We don't have enough testing centres to carry out these tests. We don't have enough examiners. So what we'll do is we'll just make the tests shorter or easier or fewer or whatever they're planning to do here. A shortage of heavy goods vehicle drivers um, is also is also being increased by the so-called pingdemic because of the spiking numbers of alerts being sent through the NHS Test and Trace app. Thousands of people are self-isolating and out of work. Isn't it interesting something about the Test and Trace app? How come it's only pinging people now? How come it didn't ping people when it was first rolled out? Isn't it weird how it's just pinging people over the last last week? Like a mass pinging over the last week? Is it because of the rising number of cases? But then there were massive numbers of cases at the beginning of the year. And we didn't hear anything about the pinging. I'm not, I, I'm just, it's a curious, a curiosity I have. A fall in the number of, heavy, of available heavy goods vehicle drivers has caused disruption to many industries. Almost every industry, I think, has been affected by it. Many supermarkets have complained of shortages as a result of many heavy goods vehicle drivers self-isolating. No, it's not because they're self-isolating. It's because they're not available because of Brexit. They haven't returned. What's happening is, as the restrictions are eased, businesses are returning to normal. Businesses are starting to put in orders as they would normally, as they're coming out of the restrictions. And the system can't support it. The system is not able to tolerate the load. Because if you think about why was this not a problem before? Because, uh, because of the restrictions, businesses were not working as much. So if they weren't working as much, whatever drivers there were available were able to operate. But as we ease the restrictions, demand went up. The demand for products went up the demand for delivery went up and the system was not able to cope or the system is not able to cope now somebody knew this was going to happen but they decided to keep quiet about it because unfortunately you'd have to point the finger at brexit uh they're self-isolating <laughs> in poland <laughs> and such uh, sorry, guys, I haven't got enough foreign uh, trucks past me do <laughs> doing over the limit on sections of road that are limited to 50 miles an hour. Brexit equals population reduction. Not good. Um, drums to the bass. Whoop. Great to see on the stream. Um, more people starving means more death, more po uh, property up for sale, less pension payouts, less health care to spend if you're dead by starvation. Well, reducing the population is a logical step to uh, accommodate a reduced economy. I, I don't know if that's the goal of the Conservatives, um, to reduce the population. Because a higher population means more trade, well, more internal trade, um, more business, more money. So I, I don't know if they're... I, I, although I, don't, I do know that the Conservatives, and I do understand the Conservatives, don't like the poor. They don't like the poor because the poor need services uh, like welfare and um, the NHS, for example. They can't go to the private. They can't pay for private health care. So the, the conservatives don't like the poor because they see them as parasites, basically. And these parasites have to be fed. They have to be clothed. They have to be given homes. They have to be given free school meals. And the conservatives don't like that because they see it as us with lots of money, giving it to poor people who have no money. And if we continue to give them money, this is the Republican in mentality in the United States as well. If we give them money, they become dependent on that money. And they'll never get out of that. Now, the people saying this are people who have inherited billions, millions and billions. They're not people who worked from the bottom all the way up. 
to the top. Jacob Rees-Mogg. Do you think Jacob Rees-Mogg has worked a day in his life? Boris Johnson. Do you think Boris Johnson understands what it's like to live, you know, on the on the poverty line? Do you think Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, Nigel Farage, any of these people understand the the dilemma of do I pay the gas bill this month or do I pay my rent this month? Because if I pay one, I can stay in the building. If I pay the other, I can try and work something out to stay in the building next month. But my children don't freeze to death or I don't freeze to death. These people have no concept of that. They have no concept of the, the choices people have to make when they have very, very limited resources. The choices that Jacob Rees-Mogg or Nigel Farage make is, should I take the red Range Rover to work to, well, to, to the office today, or do I take the blue Range Rover? Dilemmas, dilemmas. These are the, or do I get chauffeur driven or do I drive it myself? I feel like, you know, the ex- experiencing the open road. Anyway, that's enough cynicism for a while. Okay, let's let's move on. Of course, staying with the pandemic, uh, it says here about Sage. So Sage advisor claims ministers trying to get as many as possible infected with COVID. <clears throat> so this is Professor Robert West says rhetoric about caution is a way of putting putting blame on the public, and this has been, I think, the idea since the beginning. Blame the public. Things don't work out. Blame the public. Um, It's not about taking responsibility and working together. No, it's about if we can get away with it, let's just let the public take the responsibility. Let the public carry the can. Ermen, thank you so much for that super chat. Uh, Nightbot told me to buy you a coffee. By the way, we have a, a warm app too. Ah, and... A full supermarket both in Germany and Malta. Ah, oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for that super chat. Very kind of you, Airman. Have a great night. Um, don't drink too much coffee. <laughs> Especially at night or you won't sleep. Very kind of you. Um, the full supermarket in Germany because isn't there a pandemic in Germany too? Oh no, there is, there is but it's not because it's not empty because uh, there is no Brexit in Germany or Malta or also here in Italy, the supermarkets are full. The shelves are full. There is no problem. But there is still a virus, not on the same scale as in Britain, but there, there is a virus still on the rampage. Um, but even during the height of the pandemic, the supermarkets' shelves were not empty. The only thing I noticed at the very beginning was a shortage of gloves. In the first week, or the first two weeks, it was almost impossible to get your hands on gloves, literally. Because um, it seemed that people went in, because there was a requirement at the beginning of the pandemic here in Italy to wear a mask and to wear gloves. Um, It wasn't just enough to sanitize your hands, you also had to wear gloves, which was really a pain because (laughs) in May, I think it was was April or May, we had to uh, wear gloves and it was quite hot your hands with sweat inside the gloves which was quite horrible but um the gloves disappeared at the very beginning the latex gloves um but uh but i there wasn't a shortage of fruit and vegetables everything ran quite smoothly so you know when the british government are saying it's because of the the pandemic it's because of the app uh no it's as i've said the pandemic, the restrictions are decreasing, requirements for heavy goods vehicles are going up, but there aren't enough available because of the because of Brexit. So the scientist advising the government has accused ministers of allowing infections to rip through the young population in an effect uh, in an effort to bolster levels of immunity before the NHS faces winter pressures. The allegations come after England's remaining COVID restrictions were eased on Monday, with nightclubs throwing open their doors for the first time in the pandemic, and all rules of social distancing and mask wearing dropped even as infections run high. Ministers were made aware of scientists' uh, scientists concerns 
about reopening nightclubs and other crowded, close contact and poorly ventilated venues without testing or even checks in place. On Monday, Boris Johnson made the uh, surprise announcement that COVID passports would be required for such settings, but not until the end of September in about two months' time. I'll come back to that in a moment. Gareth, thank you so much for that super chat. Gareth, um, could you believe the business secretary on Sky News this morning? The Northern Ireland Protocol isn't set in stone. <laughs> what a schmuck. Living the, loving, loving the content as always. P.S. F the Tories. <laughs> I think you said F. Thank you so much, Gareth. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it's the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. No, it's not set in stone. It, it, it's... It's adjustable. It's adjustable to a, you know, in the way that we want to adjust it. But as I said before on numerous occasions, the EU doesn't have a problem with the protocol. The Irish government doesn't have a problem with the protocol. The nationalist and moderate parties in Northern Ireland don't have a problem with the protocol. It's not that they're happy with the protocol. Very few people are happy with the protocol, but they they're not trying to undermine it. They're not saying that it's a problem. They understand the value of it. But it's only the British government that has a problem with the protocol. Why is that? It's not set in law. <laughs> yes. It's like, you know, you sign a contract and then you try and go back and say, yeah, but this contract, you know, it can be changed at any time. Uh, no, 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 it can't. It's stamped. <laughs> it's it's you know it's even more than a contract because a contract between two people, if one of them breaks it, you have to go to court, um, and you need lawyers involved, and you need to be able to prove that the contract was was worth was worth something. But this is an international contract. It's it's a British. It's in British law. It's not just a, a handshake. Between Boris Johnson and Ursula von der Leyen. It's a real document. It's much more serious than these people are trying to take it. Or trying to present it as. Um, so it goes on to say here. The um, ministers were made aware of the Sorry, Yes, I said that. But until September. Um, bon the Tories. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wes. Wes G. Bond the Tories. <laughs> uh, I, I'm glad you used that word and not something else because then I probably wouldn't be able to read it out. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. Very kind of you. Um, I agree. The So this idea, yeah, we're going to bring in passports, but not now, but we'll do it in September, at the end of September. It's Once again, it's like saying, yeah, we're going to fight the fire, there's a fire burning. Boris, uh, the, the, the the furniture is on fire. Um, here's a fire extinguisher. Do you want to put it out? Um, yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. Okay. Well, let's initiate the... Pull the trigger. Fire fire the fire extinguisher at the fire. And um, Boris is like, no, no, no. Wait, wait a bit. <laughs> what? Yeah, we'll give it another couple of minutes. Why? Um, just... Just, just let it burn a bit more and then I'll start using the fire extinguisher. Not that pass, COVID passports are a fire extinguisher. They're not stopping the pandemic. But they're limiting the spread in a way because they are stopping people from entering these sites if, they, if they're not protected. Because of course people who are entering nightclubs at the moment, a lot of them are not vaccinated. And there's no check in place to make sure that they are. What we're seeing is a decision by the government to get as many people infected as possible, as quickly as possible, while using rhetoric about caution as a way of putting the blame on the public for the consequences, said Professor Robert West, a health psychologist at the University College, uh, University College London, who prepares, who participates in SAGE's behavioural science subgroup. It looks like the government judges. Uh, sorry, it looks like the government judges that the damage to health and healthcare services will be worth the political capital it can gain from the approach. From this approach, I agree one hundred percent. 
West said, adding that the ministers appear to believe that the strategy is now sustainable, unlike last year because of the vaccine rollout. So the idea is just let it rip and then we'll eventually we'll build up an immunity and then the the vaccine will pick up with what's left over. But it doesn't work like that. The problem with this approach is that you will create new variants. A large wave of infections coupled with uh, mass vaccina- vaccination would push the UK closer to herd immunity, where people, in, where enough people in the population were resistant to the virus that it no longer spreads. The threshold for herd immunity with the Delta variant is unclear, but scientists estimate that the transmission would need to be blocked at about 85% of the population. Ministers have repeatedly denied that uh, that achieving herd immunity by letting cases rise is the government's goal. Alexander, thank you so much for that super chat. With the uh, with the Brexit trade deal, Brexit trade treaties screwing, what makes sense? Um, what makes sense? The treaties being uh, being notified, by being negotiated by a porn star. <laughs> At least they they would have had. Some, sorry, um, with the Brexit negotiate. Brexit trade treaties screwing the uh, the makes that makes more sense. Uh, the treaties being negotiated by a porn star at least <laughs> have been some benefit. Yes, <laughs> at least there would have been something to see <laughs> instead of what's um, you know the result is some sort of I don't know how you would describe it uh, result being presented by Liz Truss. And Boris Johnson. Uh, not, not a nice sight. <laughs> Liz Truss's trade deals and Boris Johnson's agreements. Thanks for that super chat, uh, Alexander. Um, it says Monday's, Monday's easings of restrictions remove social distancing, the work from home order and legal requirements around mask wearing. Though ministers called on the public to remain cautious. Yes. So do as you want. But be careful. The move prompted a flurry of regional mandates to maintain masks on public transport, including the London Tube buses and trains and the Manchester Metrolink trams. Legal limits on mixing indoors lifted at the same time, allowing all businesses to reopen. This, We're going to have to look at how cases are rising over the next number of weeks because it's going to take about a week or 10 days before we're going to see how cases are rising. Um, The changes in the rules led to some clubs to open at midnight on Sunday, leading to packed bars and dance floors across England. Similar scenes in the Netherlands in recent weeks led to uh, Dutch Premier Mark Rutte to reimpose curbs on bars, restaurants and nightclubs as new cases rose sevenfold. The Health Secretary... The Shadow Health Secretary John Ashworth said abandoning all the precautions and allowing infections to climb not only risks further restrictions in the future, it condemns thousands of long-term illness and um, and places huge pressure on the NHS. Rising COVID admissions are ex- uh, are helping are helping exacerbate a summer NHS crisis with operations cancelled and increasing waiting times. It means we're heading to into another difficult winter and high levels of virus circulating could see a, va- a vaccine ev- evading a variant emerge. This is an utter, utterly reckless strategy um, from Boris Johnson. It seems to be the case that what they want to do is just let the, the NHS collapse or get very close to collapse and then allow the private companies to step in. You know, the test and trace was something like that. Instead of having the test and trace run by the NHS, they wanted private companies to do it. Serco, Serco for example. Um, it doesn't matter if it worked or not. They just wanted those private companies to to take advantage of public money. But when they actually got the NHS to roll out the vaccine, it's been pretty much a, a success. Um, now, there seems to be a problem with perhaps supply issues 
because Boris Johnson and the, his government may have betted on the wrong may have bet on the wrong horse betted bet on the wrong horse um, because there may be a shortage of AstraZeneca vaccines um, now the European Union doesn't seem to have any shortages at the moment remember at the, at the beginning the Brexiteers were saying it's great that we're outside the European Union we're able to beat the European Union when it comes out comes to the rollout of the vaccine notice that Brexiteers have stopped talking about the rollout of the vaccine when they compare Britain to the European Union now I said at the beginning this is not a race we have to work together it doesn't matter if Britain comes first it doesn't matter if Germany comes first or Italy or whoever there, there is no winner but there are many losers. If we don't work together, we all lose. And um, this idea, it's about Britain beating Europe in some way. This was once again the Brexit mentality. So this is concerning. And of course, it seems to be um, another case of just reopening, like opening the floodgates. So the UK government opening floodgates to COVID variants, MPs warn. The government is opening the floodgates to new co new versions of COVID. Cross-party group of MPs has warned after revealing a steep decline in the proportion of positive tests being analysed for variants among people arriving from red list countries. What's happening also with the red list countries is that the border force are being told, um, not the red list countries, but amber countries, amber list countries, don't bother to check people. Don't bother to check the documents that confirm whether people had a test or not just let them in the analysis of the nhs test and trace data was carried out by the house of uh, commons uh, library commissioned by the chair of the all party parliamentary group on coronavirus uh, leila morin the results suggest that in the three weeks to march 17th um, there were an estimated 1,769 to 1,872 positive tests from people entering the UK from red list countries. W weren't there supposed to be nobody coming in from these red list countries? You know, the, how many times have we heard from Brexiteers, we need to control the border unless it's to the pandemic. Then we don't want to control the border. Of which somewhere between 63% and 68 were sequenced to determine the variant involved. By contrasting, uh, by contrast, in the three weeks to June the 30th, there were an estimated 445 to 507 positive tests from people entering the UK from red list countries, with an estimated estimates of the proportion sequence ranging from 12% to 33%. These figures are truly staggering and make a mockery of the UK government's claim to be a global leader in genome sequencing, said Moran, adding that the rise of the beta variant in Europe should be setting alarm bells ring, ringing in government. It's, this is one of my ideas, was that I thought what they wanted was to let the, variant, let the virus in so they could study it. Now it's, they don't want to study it anymore. <laughs> they just want to let it in. Maybe they've studied it not enough, and they said, OK, uh, should we close the gate? No, no, no. It's not worth it. Just leave the gate open. Yeah, but we're going to let the, it. doesn't matter. It's... <laughs> I'm too lazy. <laughs> it's the Boris Johnson approach. <laughs> Just let it go. It'll sort itself out. The beta variant The beta variant was first detected in South Africa and has been found in the UK but did not take off. However, concerns about a rise in the variant in France and other territories prompted the UK government to announce even fuller, fully vaccinated people entering the UK from France would continue to need to vaccinate, sorry, quarantine for 10 days. The analysis from the APPG also revealed that the sequencing of positive test results from people entering the UK from amber list countries has fallen in the same period. It seems to me just, we're not bothering to check anymore. We're not bothering to sequence these um, these variants anymore sequence the genome of these variants we've gotten what we've we wanted we got the information we wanted and that's it but instead of closing the gate closing the door blocking these cases blocking these this virus from coming in it seems to be just leave it open 
Sorry, let me read some of your comments. Um, Moran. Moran? Oh, it's not Morn. Like in, well, in Ireland we call it Morn. Moran. Sorry, Moran. Uh, thanks, Vicky. <laughs> um, UK is a global leader in invention, infection, sorry, infection spikes, yes. I think a vaccination could give you about 60% 60 extra chance that even if you got COVID, you wouldn't end up in hospital. Yeah, it's not about protecting so much people from COVID completely. It's about stopping people from developing it enough that they need to go into a hospital. Um, and that's it. It's doing its job. You know, it's there is this maybe a misconception that it, the the vaccine will completely protect you. No, it, it doesn't. It's it's about protecting you enough that you don't have to go into hospital, or if you go into hospital, that it's not serious that you don't need to be put on a ventilator, for example. Um, and that's important to remember. Uh, we need to protect the healthcare system. We need to stop it from being overwhelmed. <laughs> Milliband woke out of a coma. Did anyone notice? Uh, no, I didn't see him this week. Was he in? Was he speaking? I didn't see that. Um, Britain was going downhill. Was going downhill, but now it's going down cliff. <laughs> Sorry to laugh, but that's a funny sort of analogy. Yes, <laughs> the Tories have studied the virus enough to know that it works. <laughs> yes, Titanic success. Verti, well said. Welcome to the stream, Verti. Sorry, I didn't say hello before. Um, we Brits pride ourselves on our lazy dirtiness. <laughs> anyway, let's continue. Almost getting to the end of the stream, but... Uh... Now, what's very interesting is, as I've said before, there's a shortage of workers like heavy goods vehicle drivers. So the government have, of course, brought in... Well, this is... Uh exemptions so some people don't need to self-isolate as i've said um the idea may be suggesting that maybe heavy goods vehicle drivers if they get pinged they say no no it's okay i don't need to self-isolate because i am a special case so sky news has it seems uh, discovered who else is on this list of special cases is the prime minister a document uh, printed off from the government's website runs to 12 pages and it is basically telling us uh, who uh, can apply to be exempt from the uh, self-isolation, the pandemic. And as you might expect, it's people in critical services ranging from uh, transport to emergency services. In the uh, document, in the uh, guidance, it says this policy only applies if you or your employer has received a letter from a government department on which your name is listed. And it begins by saying that self-isolation remains an essential tool. So it's important to stress these are exemptions. Who it applies to? Well, there's a list here. And uh, it says that arrangements have already in place for frontline health and care staff. Well, we know about that. That was announced a few days ago. But here's the crucial list. Um, Energy is one area. Obviously, the power stations, keeping the lights switched on uh, throughout the uh, UK, um, and civil nuclear power, so presumably nuclear power stations. So energy, crucial. Uh, fuel, uh, gas, um, um, of electricity generation, nuclear power. Then digital infrastructure, that's keeping broadband switched on, uh, making sure that everyone's got Wi-Fi and so on, businesses have got it. Uh, and next comes food production and supply. Well, we're expecting to hear more about some measures uh, by the government to keep uh, to uh, solve the crisis or at least help try and deal with the crisis of empty... But food supply, food production and supply... Does that include, like, Nutella? <laughs> Does that include Coca-Cola? Of course, Coca-Cola. I don't know if Coca-Cola is produced in the UK. Maybe it is. Um, but is Coca-Cola a, a food supply that needs to be maintained? It, it, you, you, do you understand some of the problems with this? You could expand it out to very... You could expand it pretty far out. You know, I produce... <laughs> snacks um you know crisps are, are they you know is are the the workers producing packagings uh, putting crisp bags into boxes are they essential workers that 
should be exempt from self-isolating. Empty shelves in the soup. <laughs> Gammon production. <laughs> oh my god. Supermarkets, but food production and supply is one of the air. <laughs> Iron brew, <laughs> an essential essential drink. Yes, more in, more essential than water. <laughs> areas on this list um, so that uh, could be everything from uh, food processing plants uh, uh, the, the meat industry has been uh, very critical today of the problems th about the problems they're facing technically it could be almost anything <laughs> you know if you if you make a strong enough case look i make wicker baskets <laughs> but if you know if um no offense to anyone making wicker baskets but it's just the first thing that popped into my head um, you know, we need to transport food in these wicker baskets. So if we don't produce the wicker baskets, then you can't transfer, transfer, um, picnic, you know, we make essential picnics. Um, our staff need to be exempt. Seeing, uh, abattoirs, slaughterhouses, meat production, all sorts of food production, waste. So that's sewage. Most important in the hot weather, no doubt. Uh, water, keeping, making sure the, uh, there's plenty of water in our taps. The reservoirs are given despite the dry... <laughs> <laughs> Xanax is as is, is important to health as <laughs> our Oh, yes. Sausage production. <laughs> oh, see, not an exempt. <laughs> oh, my... <laughs> Our Pringles on the list. I bloody well hope so. <laughs> Whether are able to supply beer, beer. I I swear to God, if beer, if beer is ex is not exempt, people will riot and people will. Be, yes, tenants extra. No beer could ever <laughs> could be a real problem. No beer. People would riot if there's no beer. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> You guys are amazing. <laughs> jelly beans. <laughs> jelly babies, sorry. Jelly babies. <laughs> Does the UK import fresh water? <laughs> Let's not have a, a poop. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so everyone, essentially, everyone in the country is essential. <laughs> Uh, do vegan products count as boot? Yes, they do, of course. Uh, lithium batteries, <laughs> lithium tablets <laughs> become essential before too long. Uh, pri <laughs> privileged sausages. Um, don't forget toilet roll. Yeah, without toilet roll. <laughs> what would we panic by? <laughs> Alphabet, alphabet spaghetti. It's, it's an essential meal. <laughs> Oh, enough yeah. water veterinary medicines um obviously for agriculture as well as uh, for uh, domestic pets no doubt essential chemicals then comes essential transport well obviously that's uh, everything from uh, air so essential transport does that include driving to barnard castle to test your eyesight air traffic controllers uh, railway signalers the government's talking about but also uh, people who are working on the buses, the trains and the tube in London. Uh, Does that include big red buses with £360 million pounds for the NHS on the side? Um, uh, next uh, comes medicines, supply of medicines, medical devices, obviously. <laughs> medicines? Is Viagra a medicine? <laughs> all sorts of medical equipment clinical consumer supply consumable supplies that's presumably pills in the chemist and the supermarket then uh, comes emergency services well this obviously is predictable uh, police fire services and so on um, and then the border control uh, obviously a very contentious area at the moment with all the uh, debate about border controls uh, border controls on the list then essential defense outputs well, that must be barracks and all sorts of protection of um, all sorts of uh, security and protection. Um, Ministry of Defence establishments, RAF, Navy and so on. Essential defence outputs, it says here. And then local government. Well, that's obviously relates to keeping the bins uh, emptied, uh, 
there have been suggestions that some councils are short of refuse collectors and the bins are under threat. So, a great long list there. Um, obviously predictable, uh, the areas that we know have been suffering. We are expecting to hear more about moves to uh, keep uh, uh, supplies of food and other goods to supermarkets a little later. Yes, I mean, it comes to something, John, doesn't it, um, when you need an exemption to keep the lights on in the country. Uh, but can I just clarify, is that exempt if you're double jabbed or yes. just exempt? Yes, that's right. I will, I will read you what it says. It says, um, yeah, that this policy applies to named workers in specifically approved workplaces who are fully vaccinated, defined as someone who is 14 days post final dose and who have been identified as close contacts. Uh, it says that permission to attend work is contingent on following certain controls uh, agreed by the Department of Health. Uh, this is not a blanket exemption for all workers in a sector, it says. But yes, it is uh, fully... Uh, fully. Mm. But if people are fully vaccinated, then do they need to self-isolate anyway? I didn't think it was a requirement to self-isolate if you're fully vaccinated. And some are shortages. Vaccinated and somebody who's had it uh, uh, at least 14 days ago. Uh, and just quickly, um, any sign of confidence from government uh, about whether this will be enough? Well, they obviously hope it will. I mean, I, on the Sky News earlier today, Kwasi Kwarteng was... Uh, uh, was talking about fingers crossed. That was a phrase he used in an interview with Kay Burley when he was talking about uh, uh, the whole tackling the whole pandemic uh, problem. Um, the government, as you know, uh, is going to get rid of this uh, this uh, this ping uh, uh, process on the 16th of uh, August. Fingers crossed, said Mr. Kwarteng. Uh, today in the House of Commons, Ger <laughs> so it's fingers crossed. Don't worry, everything is fine. Boris has it under control. Fingers crossed. Believe in Brexit. Believe in the the government. Believe in Boris Johnson. Everything will be fine. <laughs> don't tre don't threaten my bins, Boris. <laughs> New spec savers ad shouldn't have gone to Carnot Castle. Oh yes. <laughs> uh, even if they're fully vaccinated, uh, that's forty five percent. The rest, 55%, will be will be infected, yes. Are YouTube channels essential? Yes, they are. Bike, bike packing adventure. Yes, they friggin' are. <laughs> okay. So, as we know, there's an idea of, well, let's just reopen everything. And, well, here's a festival that's likely or possibly going to become a super spreader. Two years in the wilderness, a moment to finally run wild and free at a festival. Remember them? Only the pandemic hasn't gone away. And the moment has finally come. Tonight, 40,000 people will dance again, which begs the big philosophical question of the day. Can you really be a free spirit like in the olden days, in the era of a pandemic? The four day festival is the first full capacity event since England's so-called Freedom Day. Tens of thousands will dance together at Latitude Festival with no social distancing or masks. But if you haven't got a negative COVID test, you're not coming in. How did it feel to walk through the gates? I was so happy, <laughs> like, seeing everyone like... <laughs> it's like COVID like, never existed. Yeah. It's like there's yeah. no like masks or social distancing. It's, it's like a different world. Yeah. Are you worried about that though? Do you, does any part of you think, oh, it's just a bit of a super spreader event or do you feel quite relaxed about it? I feel quite Slow. relaxed because we yeah. know that everyone... How many of these girls do you think got a vaccine? You got a... You, you filled out a certificate and said... Have you had the have you had a test? Yes. Did you test positive? No. Okay, you're allowed in. Everyone's kind of got had to had negative tests to come in. You look fantastic. Thanks so much. We just arrived. I feel incredibly underdressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are you feeling to be in a festival? Amazing. It's so it's great. It's absolutely lovely. Yeah. Have you missed it? Yeah, yes. this is my ninth latitude, so I've really What is the point in having a microphone on a stick? <laughs> when everyone else is sitting around and touching each other. 
miss this place wow. more than anywhere. So you're like a super fan in a way. I am a super fan. I'm so excited to be back. In lockdown and stuff, it was the one place that I dreamt of going when really? I thought about where I wanted to go. So I'm so happy to be here. Call me forensic, but are you, are you getting married? I am coming. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you're on Channel 4 News. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when are you getting married? Uh, August the 28th. <laughs> wow, don't worry, I'm not expecting anybody. But, um, <laughs> What's it like to be at a festival? Amazing. Didn't think it was ever going to happen, and I'm so pleased. So, so pleased. <laughs> um, oh my god. Um, Alexander, thank you so much for that super chat. Outsource border control to G4S. Their, their problem sorted. Um, there'll be no difference. Doesn't the Channel 4 reporter mean 40,000 people will die again? Yeah, well, that that's... There's the risk of perhaps 40,000 dying because of the easing of restrictions. What you're going to see exactly what happened, I hope I'm wrong, but it seems to be heading in the same direction as the Netherlands. The Netherlands reopened everything, cases went right up, and then a few weeks later, the Prime Minister apologised and reimposed restrictions. Now, I don't think Boris Johnson is going to apologise, and I'm not sure whether he'll reimpose restrictions, but cases are going to go up. Where's the groom? Um, he is currently on his stag do in uh, the Lake District. Oh, that's very civilised. Yeah. Well, I'm excited because yeah. we're out of prison. Yeah, I know. And it's it wonderful. Does it's feel... actually quite strange. Is it? Yeah, it is quite strange, but you, you're mixing with people. Yeah. And Sorry to kill the mood, but is going... there any bit of you that's worried about it being Nothing a super so. spreader event of any kind, or are you relaxed about it? <sighs> Oh, mixed emotions on that. Um, can you talk me through your outfit? Who are you wearing? What's the inspiration? What, why did you pick this outfit? Because I love, because I love um, creatures. You love creatures. <laughs> That's a fantastic reason. And can you talk me through your outfit? Um, I chose this outfit because it. I love rainbows and I love pink, so that's why I chose this outfit. Totally, I get it. It looks great. Are you feeling liberated? Yeah. <laughs> I maybe wouldn't rock it out of the festival. No? I'm feeling quite comfortable here, yeah. You wouldn't have free nipples outside the festival. No. <laughs> As for the head... I understand people want to get back to normal. I understand people are tired of restrictions. Um, maybe, the bar maybe what the government are doing is, let's have a bit of freedom and then we'll go back into restrictions <laughs> once again. But try and make some political capital while the sun is shining. Um, or political hay, I should say. Now, before we um, before we finish, we're almost uh, almost at the end of the stream. I just want to talk about two things before we finish. First is <clears throat> the problem, read separately, and, and maybe the solution. So we're taking we're off the issue of the the pandemic for a moment, um, slightly off issue, off topic. It says here universal credit, what it's like to lose the twenty pounds a week. And then I'm going to talk about universal basic income. And yeah. them on top of each other and yeah, then and then. Like Give us this day our daily bread. These days, more than two and a half million people are relying on food banks to get theirs. This charity in Leicester doesn't wait for people to come to them. They deliver 100 food parcels every week. I'm just dropping some food parcels. 100 food parcels a week. Why? Because the government isn't doing its job. Because the local council isn't able to provide for the, the people in the town. Why? Doesn't, because it doesn't have the money available. Because it's not able to raise taxes. Or because central government hasn't provided it with the cash in order to do so. So people are going hungry. Or people are not earning enough on universal credit. Or people are not earning enough through welfare. So they have to rely on charity. What is the point of government? What is the point of having a government if it doesn't look after its citizens? I'm sorry, people seem to think of, of charity as something noble. And, and, it, and the people doing the charity are noble. Definitely. The people who, who organise this, I'll take my hat off to them. But they shouldn't need to exist. It should not be necessary in a civilised society and I'm not just criticising the UK, of course, here. I'm criticising the concept of charity. It should not be necessary. It should not exist. We as a society should provide to 
the the basics that people need to live should provide them with a home provide them with food provide them with um, the money necessary to buy the things that they need and a bit more because it helps the economy as well why aren't we doing this uh, normally we will drop off around about a hundred or so food parcels a week and uh, half of the ser service users that we drop off to are on university credit. Some of the people I've spoken to uh, are a bit worried about losing £20 a week. Uh, if you think about it, it's over £1,000 a year. The extra £20 a week was introduced as a temporary measure at the start of the pandemic. It's estimated to have cost an extra £6 billion, bringing the total bill for universal credit to £74 billion. In justifying an end to the uplift, the government says, universal credit has provided a vital safety net for 6 million people during the pandemic. Our focus now is on our multi-billion pound plan for jobs, which will support people in the long term by helping them learn new skills and increase their hours or find new work. Increase their hours or find new work. But if jobs are disappearing because of technology, for example, um, if the way of working is changing where people are not able to actually get the type of job where they can actually build on and what i mean by that is they're not able that they're able to save that they're able to buy a home that they're able to um plan for the future more and more jobs are in the gig economy where people have to work maybe three or four jobs in order just to survive and they always have this sort of damocles over their head because they could receive a text message at any moment saying we don't need you today you can stay at home or we don't need you this week you can stay at home or come in now, we need you. And then by the time you get there, the company turns around and says, actually, we don't need you. Um, uh, you can go home, even though you're, you've just arrived. How are people supposed to build a future on that? There was a time where a couple with a couple of kids, you know, a husband, wife, or a par two partners and two children could live in their own home, their own home. They could buy the house themselves and they could buy it on one salary, on one wage. That's unthinkable today. So they go ahead with this cut. It'll be the biggest single overnight cut to welfare since the Second World War. So since the modern day welfare system. And it is going to hit the poorest families in Britain. It's going to hit the places which the government has said they want to level up. And it is going to create immense immediate hardship and it is completely avoidable six million people are going to be affected by this it seems that's what they said at the beginning six million people were given this um 20 pounds uplift can you imagine if this six million people turned out and voted can you imagine if this six million people turned out and protested can you imagine six million people marching on Westminster. Can you imagine the, the damage that would do to the government? Do you imagine the voice that would have? Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. David, thanks you, thank you so much for that super chat. Hi, Max. Um, I've watched a few of your videos and I like the way that you do. Uh, I like what you do, sorry. Here's a pint. Oh, thank you so much for that. Or thereabouts on me. Best wishes from Galway. Ah, on Galiev. Thank you so much, David. Uh, very kind of you. Thanks. I will enjoy the pint and have a great weekend. Uh, and thanks for coming on the stream. And thanks for the super chat. Six million people now get universal credit. That's nearly double the number before the pandemic. Hi, Joseph. How are you doing? I'm fine, thanks, mate. Yeah? yeah Joseph Valentine has been on universal credit for much longer. Complex health oh, issues and, uh, mean he can't work. I like to eat chicken and fish and... I would have to cut down on the fish. I would have to cut down on the chicken. These people would deliver the food parcel to me. They don't deliver meat or nothing like that. So that's one of the help that 24 now gonna show me, say, wow, I can't eat chicken, I can't eat fish. What would you say though to the government who've argued that now their focus is in getting people back into work? What about the people who cannot work? What about the people 
where, 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 where live this on benefit, because the government say, you are not fit to work. And that's you. And with me. My name is Anthony Lyman. I'm a father of two, and I'm on universal credit. 40 miles south of Leicester, Anthony Lyman in Northampton has been on universal credit since he lost his job three years ago. He's receiving help from Christians Against Poverty. We have relied on the local church, um, the food bank, even with the £20. The problem we've got is bills have gone up, food has gone up, the price of um, energy has gone up, and there's lots of other things, even daily commuting. So the thing we would really have to wrestle with is whether we can keep our households going, whether we can feed our children, whether we can clothe our children, because that money we've grown to rely on. The way I would describe it is like dangling a carrot in front of you and then suddenly whipping it away. The cut to universal credit is due to come into effect in October. Charities are forecasting what they describe as a winter of hardship, when many more people will have to rely on the kindness of strangers. When it should not be the case, when it should be the state providing the basics. Now, I want to share with this story, I'm not going to read the entire story, but it's, and it's actually an article I disagree with about universal credit. Now it says here, universal credit, uh, sorry, you, not universal credit, universal basic income. It says here, universal basic income won't do America's young any good. Now, this article has a lot of faults in it, and I'm going to point it out here. It says here, it's a simple utopian idea. If we give everyone a monthly check, we can eliminate poverty and do away with the inefficiencies of our cumbersome and flawed welfare state. Minneapolis in the US is the largest city to give a universal basic income a try. It offered $500 a month for 18 months to 150 of its low income residents with no work or spending restrictions. But um, others worry it's not so simple. A UBI would be expensive. Isn't it interesting? So when the first is it's expensive. When, when we're investing in people, we always look at the cost. When we're investing in war, for example, we never say, well, maybe it's a bit too expensive to go to war. Even though we're taking very expensive objects and blowing them up, firing them at buildings to destroy the building and to destroy the weaponry. Like missiles are not free, okay? <laughs> they cost a lot of money. And what do they do? They slam into a tank or they slam into a building or they slam into people and they explode. And that's money gone. But when it comes to people, well, we have to be careful that we don't overspend. Anyway, um, a, news, a newspaper suggests they, that UBI skeptics may be right. Oh, sorry, a UBI would be expensive. And, it, um, and what if it discourages people to work, which could inadvertently increase inequality and lead to social instability? So the idea right off the bat is that it's expensive, so we shouldn't be spending money on people. And then the second is it might discourage people to work. So people's reason for existence is to work. Not you should be here to enjoy life. You should not be here to uh, savor the world, the universe. No, you should be here to make money for someone else. Because really, that's what you're doing when you work. Not all the time, but generally, unless you're working for yourself, um, if you're working in a corporation, if you're working in a company, you're working to make someone else richer. Not to make yourself rich. You're getting just enough to, to survive in many cases. So these people want you to work for the sake of working. So if we discourage work, that's a problem. I don't see a problem with discouraging work because many people will work because they like doing it. So most, the majority of people work because they have to, not because they like it, which would could inadvertently uh, increase inequality. So people, there is inequality because there isn't enough work. No, there's inequality because there are people working and they're not earning enough to survive. 
and there are people at the top who are earning astronomical numbers, astronomical amounts of money that um, that doesn't actually go anywhere. You know, Jeff Bezos would never be able to spend all the money he has. He could give away 99% of his money and he would still not have, he would still have a, a remaining amount that he wouldn't be able to spend in a lifetime. How is that something that we should maintain? How is that something that is ac acceptable? Anyway, a new paper suggests UBI, that UBI skeptics may be right. Hmm. The policy may cause more harm than good and a very, good, a very high cost too. UBI, testing UBI is not easy. Uh, what makes UBI universal and basic is that everyone gets the money and this flow of cash is predictable and, last, and long lasting. <clears throat> Excuse me. UBI advocates point to the few experiments that show um, giving people money doesn't cause them to work less. But the Minneapolis trial and other studies aren't truly UBI because they're short. The payments were only, um, only lasted a year or two and that the that impermanence changes how people respond and that's true if you know if i say we're going to give you 500 dollars a month or 500 euros a month or 500 pounds a month for two years you're going to you're going to use that money in a different way than if i was to say i'm going to give you 500 pounds per month for the rest of your life because you're going to plan them to use the money in a different way so the experiment is not perfect because the people's reaction to the experiment, to the reaction to their money, the use of the money will be different. It's not, it's not a, I understand the, the problem, one of the problems with UBI is the testing of it to make sure that it works or to understand how it works because the models we use are, are not universal and they're not basic. That's the problem. You're not giving it to everyone. You're giving it, giving it to a small number of people um, and it's not for the rest of their life it's for a, a limited amount of time uh, most financial sorry because I'm a year or two and okay most uh, financial and work decisions are based on one's outlook for lifetime income not a few months of cash and I agree with that and that's a problem with the, the way it's tested how UBI payments are structured is also important another widely um, cited study looks at income payment <clears throat> sorry income paid each year from the Alaskan permanent fund economists estimate that the payments haven't caused Alaskans to de decrease work and may even encourage beneficiaries to do more part-time work but the permanent fund isn't a true UBI either because payments are based on the state uh, the state's oil revenues and thus vary significantly year to year but this it's not perfect but it's better than the other one i think a ubi that is said okay we're going to give you 50 pounds a week sorry 50 pounds a month for the rest of your life this would be a better model to test than if you were to say i'm going to give you 500 pounds a month for two years because the people's way of using the money would be completely different even if you were to give them the same amount of money, you say, we're going to give you 500 pounds per month for the rest of your life, or we're going to, if you, you have two groups, group A, 500 pounds a month for two years, group B, 500 pounds a month for the rest of their lives. They're going to spend the money in a completely different way. And you can't use one model and say against the other and say the first one is, uh, is correct and the second one isn't. The best model is to give it to everyone for the rest of their life. So this is for the rest of your life. It, it just, I think it's quite simple. It's an easy thing to understand. So these payments uh, actually increase uh, Alaskan's uh, income risk, which is the opposite of what a UBI is supposed to do. In, in regards to the oil revenues, yes, because the revenues go up and down, it's not a, pro it's not a correct way to test a UBI. And then they're saying that it's doing the opposite of what a UBI is supposed to do. Yes, because it's not a UBI. The Alaskan oil revenues, which are which is a dividend given to people in Alaska, I think it's per year, it's not per month. Um, it's it's not a UBI because it's not 
a fixed amount every year. This article is complaining about the models used, and yes, but the models used are not UBI models. Advocates might say that these studies aren't close enough, but close is not enough in this case. Claiming that the models represent uh, UBI is like saying a fixed rate console bond is a close approximation to a two-year bond or a dividend paying stock. We know that these two types of assets have completely different values and can therefore expl uh, elicit completely different behavior on the part of the investor in terms of risk-taking and wealth effects. Yes, but you're comparing apples and oranges here. A UBI and a bond are completely two different, uh, com two completely different things. A new study from the National Bureau of Economic Research takes a different approach to evaluating UBI. E um, economists reviewed lottery winners over a five-year period. Lottery winners are a good test for UBI because lottery winners are large enough uh, for the income generated to be life-changing. The average win uh, was estimated to be equivalent of an extra $7,800 a year, similar to UBI proposals. Lottery winners were also chosen at random, which makes them a good experiment. Contrary to creativity, motivation and entrepreneurship uh, getting unlocked, rot lottery winners were, fo uh, were found unlikely to start successful businesses. Now, the problem with this is <laughs> a lottery winner is a, perf is a terrible example to use as a as a model for a UBI because a lottery winner wins a lump sum. It's not, there are two types, there is a type of lottery here in Italy called win for life where they, I think you earn something like $25,000, sorry, 25,000 euro a year or something like that for the rest of your life. So they don't give you a lump sum, they give you a fixed amount per year or per month, I don't remember. That would be a better example to use than a lottery winner. But giving a lottery winner a lump sum and saying, oh, look, they didn't start a business. Yes, because most people who play the lottery don't have money. They don't know business. They don't know how to invest. And I'm not criticizing them. It's just that they don't know this because they, they're not in the business of investing money or starting businesses. They don't have an entrepreneurial mind. Yes, of course not. Most of us don't. So if you give anyone a big lump of money when they had nothing before, many people are going to spend it on holidays or on Ferraris or something like that. And after a couple of years, it's gone. But if you were to give them a fixed amount of money every month, you're going to have a completely different outcome. It goes on to say winners were also found to work less and were less likely to switch to lower paying jobs. Many winners were observed to have moved soon after the win, usually to a relatively rural area, but few moved to fancier neighbourhoods in terms of college attainment uh, or neighbourhoods. Average income and other metrics um, are also uh, a proxy for a prox um, opportunities available to them and their children. There was one positive effect. Lottery winners were more likely to marry and less prone to divorce. But lottery winner is a terrible example to use. You may think living in the countryside and working less isn't so bad. Working in a low-paid job can sometimes offer other benefits like flexibility and time with your children, but these are costs. Working less um, at a less demanding job often means you forego learning new skills and wage increases. Once again, see, this, is filling, this is falling back into the you need to work more so you can earn more, so you can be more productive in society because the the people who spend the most are the most productive, are the people we must look up to. The people who work all the time. Those are the people we should admire. Not the people who say, actually, I'm happy with a smaller amount of money because, I've ha because I have enough. How can we never admire these people? We always have to admire the, the one who has the biggest car or the, the most expensive apartment or the swimming pool or the... Um, the holidays around, you know, in Dubai or whatever like that. Why are we, I'm not criticizing anyone for doing these things. I'm just saying our society says we, we have to emulate that. And in order to emulate that, we need to have lots of money. And in order to have lots of money, we need to work our arses off and spend less time with our families, less time doing things that we actually like and more time 
trying to accumulate wealth so that we can show it off to people. This is not, a, it says, um, this is not a big deal for middle-aged people, but uh, you can leave young people who are, st you, sorry, but it can leave young people who are still establishing their careers and acquiring skills much worse off. Most wage increases occur in your 20s and 30s, and if you miss out on those years, the odds are you won't catch up. But this is a problem of the system. It's not a problem of the UBI. Our current welfare system is imperfect, but the fact that it makes uh, payments contingent on earnings, age, and even having a child is a better alternative. When you have a bureaucracy behind the decision of whether person A gets a welfare payment or person B gets a welfare payment, that's a cost. It's a very it's a very expensive bureaucracy. Isn't it interesting that this article doesn't criticize the cost behind the bureaucracy of a welfare system and how if we actually gave people the money then we wouldn't actually have to pay this expensive bureaucracy. First of all it's much cheaper because um, you don't have to give people sorry first of all uh, it's much cheaper because you don't have to give money to those who don't need it. But it's not expensive to give money to people who don't need it. Because the, when you give part money to people who don't need it, what are they going to do with it? They're going to spend it. Spend it in the economy. Now, it, there's a cost, in a sense, of giving money to rich people. And I accept that. But it's a small price to pay when we don't have a bureaucracy that's deciding person A gets the money and person B doesn't. Person A got the money, but they're very close to the threshold of not getting the money. And person A decides, I'm going to work less because if I work less, then I'll stay within the threshold. How is that productive? How is that a benefit to capitalism? That's why you, you'll also find many um, people on the right who support universal basic income because they understand that if you the welfare system in a sense keeps many people from working more because if in many cases if you work more you earn more and then you're pushed over the threshold and you're no longer um, you're no longer able to to benefit from some of the welfare benefits Alex thank you so much for that super chat if a person earns forty six thousand eight hundred dollars and save all the money uh, every year, it would take 21,000 years to make $1 billion. Jeff Bezos has $130 billion. <laughs> that would take you 2.8 million years. <laughs> 2.8 million years. <laughs> My God. That's insane. And... We're, we're perfectly happy with that system. We're perfectly happy with the idea that someone can have $130 billion. Now, there is this idea, well, well, he earned it. You know, he worked hard. <laughs> and you can do it too. No, you can't. Um, in order to get to a millionaire, maybe if you work hard and you scrimp and scrave and you make the right investments and you buy the, and you have the right connections, then you can get to a million. But to get to a billion, you need to corrupt the system. The system needs to be corrupt enough in order to allow a millionaire to get to to become a billionaire. To becoming a mil to become a millionaire, you can work. You know, you can work within the system. If you're very lucky, you can save. You can buy buy. You know, make the right investments, make profit from that. Uh, maybe you inherited some money. You can get to a million. But to get to a billion, you need a corrupt system. And you know, we, we can see it for ourselves how the system is designed to protect people like Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos could, as you said here, he could give away all of the 99.99% um, of this money and he would still have enough um, that he wouldn't be able to, to spend. It's insane. Thanks for that super chat, Alex. Um... So it goes on to say, the first of all, it's cheaper because you, okay, you give money to... Second, guaranteed money or money you get no matter what happens is worth much more 
than income that comes, sorry, second, guaranteed money or money you get no matter what happens is worth more than income that only comes up some of the time. This means money we give people, the bigger the impact, sorry, the more, sorry, the more money we give to people, the bigger the impact it would be on their behavior and not often in a good way. So if we give people money, they're going to do something. If we make people work for the money, they're going to behave in a different way. One issue with the recent lottery study is that it only tracks winners um, for several years. Many lottery winners think their windfall will set them up for life, but in the end filling, uh, filing for bankruptcy and even prone to depression about health. But this demonstrates the challenges of implementing a universal basic income. No, it does not. It's only offered. Uh, once it's offered, it will become difficult to take away. And doing so can leave people worse off. So we won't try and... This is amazing. So this is from the Manhattan Institute. Um, giving people a universal basic income is a bad idea because we'll probably have to take it away some at some stage. You know, the same people who were advocating for welfare had the same response from the critics. If you give welfare to people, what if, what if we have to take it away? People will become dependent on welfare. And if we take it away, then they're in trouble. Well, don't take it away then. Well, we can't introduce a UBI because if we do, um, then we have to take it away, then they'll be in trouble. Well, then don't take away the UBI. Don't call it a UBI if you're going to take it away at some stage. It should be part of the Constitution. It should be written into the Constitution, something like a UBI for everyone, universal basic income for every citizen over the age of 18 for the rest of their life. And if someone wants to take it away, they have to change the Constitution, which is extremely difficult to do. You'd need the, um, a referendum or you would need a massive majority in both houses of Parliament to change the Constitution, something like that. But if it's written into the Constitution, there's a UBI, governments will not be able to get rid of it. It'd be unconstitutional. It'd be challenged in the courts. And any party that would be attempting to remove it would lose power. So if you want to if you want to introduce a UBI, I think it's quite simple. If you want to put it in the constitution, I think if it's presented in the right way, people will support it. But of course the people who who will benefit from a UBI want it. The people who don't care about a UBI don't want it. And unfortunately the people who don't want it are the ones in power at the moment. So guys, I went way over the time. Uh, I want to say massive thank you to everyone who came on tonight. I talked a lot about UBI, so I hope the UBI advocates are happy. <laughs> um, thanks so much to everyone who sent a super chat. Greatly appreciate it. I'm starting to lose my voice now. <clears throat> um, thanks once again to the moderators for doing a fantastic job, as always. Greatly appreciate it. So we'll finish uh, short and sweet tonight with our, our funny video from Janie. Wow. Whoops, I'll put down the volume a bit. And I want to say a massive thank you to everyone who came on tonight. Have a great weekend, uh, but let's watch the video first. Well, this is different for Scotland. This is some restaurant. Check that guy in full regalia. This is uh, very much the theme restaurant. It's like Camelot. Camelot and dinner. I wonder what we're having. I uh, wonder what's on the menu. Excuse me, sir. What have you got on the menu today? Uh, we've got your, uh, we've got lasagna, and for the Scottish contingent, we've got a roll and pie, a roll and square sausage, and an iron brew, an iron brew float. Uh, it's a big favourite of the Queen. She likes her iron brew. Um, there's also some specials. We've got stovies. We've got totty scone and egg, and uh, there's a big, big plate of soup. You get your lentil. Uh, barley soup and uh, there's some ham hock soup, pea and ham. So you just have to make your choices and Bob's your uncle. Somebody will deliver it. Probably like a guard, a guy dressed up in full armour. So uh, go and pick. What do you want? Tell me what you want for your dinner. Right, let me see. <laughs> uh, I will go for the pagione. Oh, sorry, that's page one. Um, I'm just going to go for a rolling pie a glass iron brew and uh, some uh, a square sausage 
Uh, a wee bit of tomato sauce on the side. Thanks very much. Wow. <laughs> Well, I hope she enjoyed it. A square sausage. I've never heard of such a thing. So, uh, Dr. Johan, thank you so much for that super chat. Hero, yay! <laughs> thanks so much for that at the very end. Greatly appreciated. Thanks. Uh, so, thanks to Dr. Johan. Thanks to everyone who sent a super chat. Thanks to everyone who smashed the like button and came on tonight, wrote a comment. And thanks to the moderators for keeping everything on the straight and narrow. Iron Brew. Have a great weekend, guys. I'll see you all na- next time. Same bat time, same bat channel, 9.30 British summertime. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Wear that mask. I know it's not obligatory at the moment, but do protect yourselves. And I'll see you all next Tuesday. Good night. Have a great weekend.